request and responsibility that I don't take lightly. I know we were told that Elder C was going to preach for us today. And those who came to hear Elder C will bring them back. But he had an obligation in Nashville that I guess wasn't aware of when he made the commitment. So I, I was, was wondering last Sabbath while I was stumbling around in the thicket. And the pastor called and said, oh, the sea can't make it, can you be that ram? And, and I, 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 I prayed to the Lord, asked my wife if we were going to be in town, and I joyously accepted the invitation. Everything that happens in our lives, we all need to know that it's not a surprise to God. He's not unaware. And so we're going to talk a little bit this morning about the word that the Lord gave me, that song. Beginning of the week, that song was in my head, but I couldn't come up with a name. I asked my wife. I couldn't give her enough words, or I definitely couldn't give her the tune. <laughs> and, and at one point we were praying, and the, and the words kept me in my head. And I was Googling, he, kept, he got me, he gets me, and all this stuff. And some really bizarre songs were coming up, but when that word, he kept me, came into my head, I put it in, I said, that's the song. I text Clint, I said, Clint, does the choir sing that song? He texts back and says, wow, that was a song we were playing. <laughs> so I appreciate the choir for bringing that this morning. I'm going to talk a little bit about something that's been on my mind for quite some time. This is kind of part two of a series that Eric and I contemplate about doing one day in some form or fashion. The Lord, y'all pray for me because the Lord, the Lord um, has given me and my wife some burdens and we fight those burdens because I'm not a preacher. Um, and, and he keeps laying them back on us. And, and he, he wants us to testify to him in some form or fashion in this community, in this world. And really this is part two or part one is where we brought to you um, about tithing and, and, and giving God our first. And when we, we came and said, God really doesn't want our money. He wants our heart. He wants our obedience. That little $24,000 we talk about is little to God. We talk, about, we talk about it like it's big. Please give me $24,000. It's little to God. When we're faithful and we're faithful, that becomes a rounding area where God, area where God can do for us. With our, with our faithfulness and his ability to bless and multiply, we can make a big difference in this community. And so we come and we're going to this is kind of the part two, and if we go we go back to the slides. The, the title of um, of my sermon or talk or lesson today is the three the three P's of the Christian walk: praise plus prayer equals power. Does anyone here want power today? I pray that this clear, concise, and hopefully short presentation that leaves you thinking and thirsting to study more about God's Word and to increase your understanding and desire for God. So I'm not here to tell you everything to you to walk away and say, well, it's a good sermon. I want to stimulate your thoughts. I want to stimulate your desire to study. I want you to walk out of here saying, I need to know more about what's in this Bible, about what God wants us to do as it relates to this. But first of all, I'm asked two questions, and you all tell me if 
these facts are true. First, and you can answer and respond by saying amen. If you don't agree or believe, please raise your hand. The first one, the God of the Old Testament and the New Testament is the same God of today. Is that a true statement? Amen. Is that a statement that you believe? Amen. Okay. The second one is powers and abilities are not diminished. Amen. Is he a weaker God than he was in the Old Testament? Is he a weaker God than he was in the New Testament? So his powers and abilities are unchanged. So if we all believe in that premise, we'll proceed with this lesson. Let's pray. Dear Heavenly Father, we thank you for all your many blessings. We thank you for the ability to come and convene on your holy Sabbath day to hear a word from the Lord that you have given to us. I pray to a cleanse my heart, my mind, and root out every sin that's in every crack and crevice of my soul. Cleanse it, forgive me, so that I will not be a barrier to transferring your message to your people. Amen. Amen. So the question is, what is praise? There's a lot of words that um, are sentiments in them that we use as it relates to praise. Extol, exalt, reverence. Fear, honor, adore, thankfulness, spirit of thankfulness, and worship. These are all synonyms of, 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 of praise and giving praise and honor. And these are words, and this is one of those words that doesn't have a great definition. It gives you a lot of other examples of what it is, so that you know what it is. But when you see it and when you feel it, you know what it is. When we look at Psalms 148, 149, and 150, the last three um, chapters in the book of Psalms, it makes, it makes very clear what praise is and why we are to praise. Psalms 148, verse 5 says, We pray, we give him praise because he created us. Because he spoke everything into being. The sun praises him during the day. The light from the sun is evidence of, of praising God for what responsibility it had to give us light, to give us warmth. And then the moon praises him by night. And the angels which he created as heavenly beings praise him both day and night. Should we who are the highest beings on this earth praise him constantly with every word that comes out of our mouth. The preacher that my wife and I listened to through um, over a podcast and he defined praise, he said, this love expressed to God as a response to his grace. Love expressed to God as a response to his grace. Then he said, love, love never fails because God is love. Praise starts with love because God loved us first. Praise starts with love because God loved us first. When you cannot think of anything to praise, just turn to John 3, 16. The verse that we learned down in kindergarten and prayer roll and all of our lives. And the key to this verse is the very first line. For God so loved the world. That's where it starts. He didn't wait on me to see if I loved him back. Right? He didn't, he didn't, he, he wasn't a quid pro quo. This wasn't something that just um, he loved us first unconditionally. And then, the ultimate sacrifice, he gave his only begotten son. Who laid down his life for you and me. And then whosoever believes in him, not pays money or does penance or has to hours of service, believe, a simple premise that believes in me, 
to not perish but have everlasting life. If that's not enough to praise, I don't know what it is. Well, you have a God that is so good that is willing to love me, not my sin, but love me even while I'm sinning. Even while I'm not being faithful to him, he still loves me. Hoping that I will turn around and come back to him. So we should lift up and praise every time we hear, think of, and see that verse. Because I'm excited that he loves me and he loves me first. One of the easiest and best ways to give God praise is to share our faith. Tell someone else about God. Tell them about how he, is, how he has worked in your life, what he has done for you, how he woke you up this morning, how the fact that you left home and got to church safe and sound. So we should tell everyone in every opportunity about his business. They should see you coming and they should say, oh boy, everyone's going along with you nice people. I'm about to talk about God's good. Right? Yeah, I love my wife. I love my kids. And if you're around me long enough, I'm going to give you, I'm going to take an opportunity to tell you about it. I'm going to tell you about my wife and how she takes care of our home, how she takes care of me, how she cooks wonderful food, how she is always there for us. When, you, when I talk about my kids, I'm going to tell them how well they're doing in school and how much they make me laugh and make me proud to be their dad. And that's just my, my love and praise for them. But hasn't God done even much more than that? Has the Heavenly Father done more for me I, and this sermon, you know, is for me, and I'm letting you in on it. Um, but it's because he's done so much for me, I should have the desire and take every opportunity to tell others about him. Yeah. And to never miss another opportunity where, where I can share my faith and, 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 and um, help others understand. This, a couple weeks ago, two instances. Um, where I, I was listening to my wife on the phone, it was, it was Friday evening, and you know my wife is super busy with the Tuna League. It's a um, great volunteer, volunteer organization. You know, we she just got two dollars an hour. We'd be much better off by the time she's spending there. But she was talking to one of her vice presidents within within the Tuna League on Friday evening. And, and I heard the lady say, I know this is your, your Sabbath is coming up. Um, when does it start? She said, well, it's, it's about to start now at sunset. And she said, oh, okay. She said, well, what, what, what religion are you? What, what is it that you believe? And so right then and there, I heard my wife give a testimony. I heard her give a testimony about who God is, about why she keeps the Sabbath, and why she doesn't do work and things uh, on, on what we do on a daily basis. And that simple opportunity where she could have missed it, but she took the opportunity to tell someone about Jesus Christ. My daughter was playing basketball at Hutchison. And she, she didn't say daddy called the coach. She told the coach, I want to be on the team but I can't play on Friday night and Saturday. And he said, oh, okay, that's, that's fine, that's fine. Um, and, and she did what she needed to do. He circled back a couple weeks ago, now, why can't she play on Friday night and Saturday? <laughs> Help me understand. And I explained to him that we keep the Sabbath. And on the Sabbath, Sabbath we don't do things secular things, and we keep the Sabbath holy, and we worship and praise God in those 24 hours. 
She's available up to sundown or after the uh, uh, up to sundown on Friday or after sundown on Saturday if you can schedule your gigs around that. And, and and he left with an understanding that he had no clue before she had told him that. And he asked that question. These are the opportunities that God puts in our lives in front of us, and we as a Christian need to make sure that we take that opportunity. That is a wonderful way to praise God by telling others about it. Guess what? Because if you're expecting to go to heaven, right? You're going to be praising a whole lot. So you might as well get started in understanding and get comfortable with praising God while you're on earth. Because you might get up there and get a little confused. What is all this praising going on? I've never heard of this before. Never done this before. Turn with me to Revelations 4, 8, and 11. Revelations chapter 4, 8 through at, no, 8 and 11. Verse 8 says, The four living creatures, each having six wings, were full of eyes around and within. And they do not, what, rest? Day or night, saying, Holy, 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 Lord God Almighty, who has and is and is to come. Day and night. So if we can't do it five minutes on earth, we're going to get real tired up in heaven. Verse 11 says, You are worthy, O Lord, to receive glory, honor, and power, for you created all things, and by your will they exist and were created. That's praising God. That's giving praises. The angels do that day and night. When you read Revelation, you'll, talk, you'll see where the, um, the elders and all will bow their heads and praise, give God praise. That's why we were created. Just as the sun gives light as it's praise, we as human beings should make sure that our lives are evidence of praise and worship to Christ. Praise is a powerful thing. It, pray, it prepares the heart to commune with God. So when we take the praise and we add prayer, we now are able to continue to multiply and build on them. So the definition of prayer is a solemn request for help or an expression of thanks to God. This is one of the most important tools to communicate with Jesus that he left us with. Prayer is also a time where we shut out all distractions and, and pause and listen to God's voice. So many times we get, we get our request in, let me hurry up, I uh, have to free my sins, help me do this, help me do that, give me this, give me that, and then we say amen and we're gone. And the Lord's standing there want to tell you what he has for you. And we're too busy to pause to listen and to hear what he has to say. We all know the Lord's Prayer, beautiful prayer that Jesus taught us in Matthew 6, 9 through 12. We've learned it since we were little. We recite it over and over. But the most important thing that happens in chapter 6 is not, I won't say the most important, but a very important thing that's, that happens in Matthew chapter 6 is not necessarily the Lord's Prayer. It's what's found in verses 5 through 8, where he gives instructions about prayer. And the Lord's Prayer was an example. So if you turn to Matthew 6, 5 through 8, it says, and when you pray, you shall not be like the hypocrites. For they love to pray standing in the synagogues and on the corners of the streets, that they may be seen by men. But surely, I say to you, they have their reward. But you, when you pray, go into a room. And when you have shut your door, pray to your Father who is in the secret place. And your Father who sees in secret will board you openly. And when you pray, do not use vain repetitions as the heathen do, 
for they think that they will be heard for their many, many words. But listen to this. Therefore, do not be like them, for your Father knows the things you have need of before you even ask. So he doesn't need to hear it over and over and over and over. Because he knows what you need before you ask, in this manner, therefore pray. So when we think about prayer, we need to think about how we have that communion with God. How we interact with God. How we prepare ourselves with God. To have this time where I can lay my soul, lay out my, 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 my bear my soul to the Lord. To be able to say, please, come into my life. Help me with the things that I struggle with. Help me to be a, a, the Christian that you need me to be. And then have the time to be able to commune and let him speak to you. When the Lord, when, when um, Horton called me and I said I'd do it, I started praying. Because if I prayed, if I preached what I came to my mind and what came from Reginald Cookwood, even the Lord probably could use it, it wouldn't be what he needed for us to hear today. And so it took me to win before it started clearing up. And coming more and more clear for me to talk about the power of praise and prayer. It hadn't been, it hadn't been long since we've been um, here at Longview when Elder Jenkins preached a sermon about the conditions of effective prayer. I remember because I took notes on my phone. Those notes are still there. And, and here's the, the eight things that he outlined in that sermon. Pray according to God's will. Pray in the name of Jesus Christ. Forgive those who trespass against us before he will answer our prayer. Forgive those that have trespassed against us. So we can't get on our knees and pray the Lord to bless me and I'm still mad at Mary Sue. Who did something to me and I'm not going to forgive him. Right? Confession of our sins as for a clean heart. Sincerity must mark our prayer. Childlike faith is a must when we pray. Perseverance in prayer. Don't give up. If you don't hear the answer right away, don't give up. Continue to pray. Even though he knows, part of that maturity and learning comes in the perseverance of, of, going, of going about it. And lean upon the Holy Spirit in your prayer. That sermon stuck with me. There wasn't a whole lot of howl on the screen. But it stuck with me because it helped me understand how to have a strong prayer life. I, I decided to um, read um, the books, Patriarchs and Prophets, and, and uh, Prophets and Kings. And, and I came across, as I was going through um, Patriarchs and uh, Prophets and Kings, I was going through and I got to the time of Solomon and the Temple. And in here, there's something we don't do a whole lot from this desk, and that's not a criticism, but I hope you will bear with me. I want to read Solomon's Prayer of Dedication. But as I read this, this prayer of dedication at that temple, I want you to listen to what is, he says at the time of Israel and understand it applies to the things that we're that's going on here today. It's found in 2 Chronicles in chapter 6. Starting at verse 12. Then Solomon stood before the altar of the Lord in the presence of all his symbols of Israel and spread out his hands. Toward heaven. And he said, Lord God of Israel, there is no God in heaven or on earth like you, who keep your, who keep your, your covenant and mercy with your servants who walk before you with all your hearts. You have kept what you promised. Your servant David, my father, you have both spoken with your mouth and fulfilled it with your hand as it is this day. Therefore, Lord God of Israel, 
Now keep what you are from you promised, your servant David, my father, saying, You shall not fail to have a man sit before me on the throne of Israel. Only if your sons take heed to their way, that they walk in my law as you have walked before me. And now, O Lord God of Israel, let your words come true, which you have spoken to your servant David. But will God indeed dwell with men on the earth? Behold, heaven and the heaven of heavens cannot contain you. How much less this temple which I have built, yet regard the prayer of your servant and his supplication. O oh Lord my God, and listen to the cry and the prayer which your servant is praying before you, that your eyes may be opened toward this temple day and night, toward this place where you said you would put your name, that you would hear the prayer which your servant takes toward this place. And may you hear the supplications of your servant and of your people, Israel, when they pray toward this place, hear from heaven your dwelling place, and when you hear, forgive. If anyone sins against his neighbor and is forced to take an oath and comes out and comes and takes an oath before your altar in this temple, then hear from heaven and act and judge your servant, bring a retribution on the wicked by bringing his way on his own head and justifying the righteous by giving him according to his righteousness. Or if your people Israel are defeated before any enemy because they have sinned against you, and return and confess your name and pray and make supplication before you in this temple, then hear from heaven and forgive the sin of your people, and bring them back to this land which you gave them and their fathers. When the heavens are shut up and there is no rain because they have sinned against you, when, the, when they pray toward this place, and confess your name and turn from their sin because you afflicted them. Then hear in heaven and forgive the sin of your servant. Your people Israel, that you, have, that you may teach them the good way in which they should walk and send rain on your land which you have given to your people as an inheritance. When there is famine in the land with pestilence or blight or, or mildew or locusts or grasshoppers which their enemies besiege them in the land of their cities. Whatever plague or whatever sickness there is, whatever prayer, whatever supplication is made by anyone or by all your people, it When each one knows his own burden and his own grief and spreads his hands to this temple, then hear from heaven, your dwelling place, and forgive. Verse 34, when your people go out to battle against their enemies, whenever you send them and when they pray, to you toward the city which you have chosen to the temple and have built in your name, then hear from heaven their prayer and their supplication and maintain their cause. When they sin against you, for there is no one who does not sin. And you become angry with them and deliver them to the enemy, and they take captive to the land far or near. Yet when they come to themselves in that land, for they are carried captive and repent and make supplication to you in the land of their captivity. Verse 41, Now therefore arise, O Lord God, to your resting place, you and the ark of your strength. Let your priest, O Lord God, be clothed with salvation, and let your saints rejoice in goodness. O Lord God, do not turn away the face of the anointing. Remember the mercies of your servant David. So when we think about the things that he was talking to God about on behalf of Israel, there's enemies that we face on a daily basis. There's times where we're taken captive um, against our will and to um, some place that we shouldn't be. There's many times where we find ourselves in similar situations as the Israelites did. That prayer still applies to us because when we bow our heads toward heaven, where Jesus Christ is today, we pray to him for forgiveness, heaven will hear you. Heaven will hear and he'll be able to come and turn our lives around. When, when God talked to Solomon, he said, and this applies to me as well as you. Verse, um, chapter 8, verse 14. If my people who are called by my name will humble themselves and pray and seek my face and turn from their wicked ways, then will I hear from heaven and will forgive their sin and heal their land. 
That's a message for you and I that was given years ago um, to Solomon. Our responsibility is to turn to him, call on, our, call on his name, and turn away from our evil ways. Every time, over and over and over, when Israel got into trouble, and they repented by, because some prophet came to them and they repented, where was God? Right there. Where was he? He was there to welcome them back and bring them back into the fold. Over and over, they would sin. But over and over, we sin. And he doesn't turn our back. And he's waiting for us to come and, and to um, seek his name. There are numerous examples of passionate prayers throughout the Bible for healing, restoration, forgiveness, raising from the dead, and blessing. And with these stories, we, we, we read where God answered, where he healed, he restored, he forgave, he raised from the dead, and he blessed. When we praise God and pray to him, then his power, God's power is unleashed. How do we man how do we manifest his unleashing, unleashing his power? In, in, in verse um, chapter 7, after that prayer from Solomon, what did God do? Chapter 7, verse 1. When Solomon had finished praying, fire came down from heaven and consumed the burnt offering and the sacrifices. And the glory of the Lord filled the temple. Immediately, not a couple hours, immediately after Solomon finished that prayer. And I, I ask that you take your time and read through that prayer, but immediately after he finished his prayer, God sent fire from heaven and consumed the burnt off. That's what's available to us. When we do that, when we praise him, when we pray, when we ask for him to step in our lives and fix the things that are going on in our lives, illness, weakness. And we have faith when we do what he says immediately. He unleashes his power to be able to help us. That same power, we agreed at the beginning of the sermon. That same power, because God is the same from the Old Testament and the New Testament, because his power is not diminished, that same power is available to you and me. We read the Bible kind of in awe of history. And looking back what he did for Israel, what he did when Jesus walked this, this earth. And we read it as a historical compilation of times where God blessed his people. That same God is existent today, sitting on the throne, waiting for us to pray to his son so he can unleash what? His power. So the question I ask myself and you, could the difference be us? Could our faith be holding us back? Could our disobedience and all the things that he's asked us to do be holding us back from unleashing his power? Could our failure to praise and to give thanks be holding us back? Or could our lacking of prayer life be holding us back? I don't have an answer, a corporate answer. That's an answer that you have to get into your closet and pray about. But I do know that this power that was unleashed in that time and in many other times in the, the Bible is available for you and I today. Power of healing, power of restoration, power of forgiveness, power to win souls, and increase membership in this church and fill this church up and, and to continue to multiply because there are people out there who want to hear from us about Jesus Christ. There's people out there who God knows where they are, but I'll guarantee you they're not going to just drive by the church and hit their brakes and pull in. Oh, this must be, God can make that happen, don't get me wrong. But we have to be able and do what he's asked us to do, share our faith.
praise to him. Tell others about him and bring them to church so they can hear the word of the Lord. I'm going to ask you to consider your life as I will consider mine. Where you may need more of God. Where you need to acknowledge God more and to give him praise. And where you may need to improve your prayer life. While you listen to this message, pray for the Holy Spirit to move in this place.
go visit the pan prostate cancer and typical visit where I go and I get my blood, blood tested. Pray that my numbers are where they should be. Have my EKG, have my chest x-ray. I'm walking out, setting my appointment for the next year, the doctor came up. He said, Dr. Cooper, he said, um, your EKG has changed from last year. I said, okay. He said, I want you to go get a stress test. So, later that week, I went and had a stress test. You get on the treadmill and see if you have any EKG change. Like you're on the stress test. I thought I passed, I thought I did well. Again, I left. And the physician called me back and said, I do want you to come and look what we see on the stress test. Okay. So I come back and he shows me that when I exercise, I had ischemia in the front part of my heart. He said, you need to have a cardiac cat. We're talking about back here. So Wednesday, I went <laughs> Later on the table, they stuck the catheter in my arteries, and watching the picture, and he showed where there's a blockage of my, 100% blockage of my left anterior descending heart. The wiggle me. Completely blocked. Thank God for the collateral that had formed in order to provide oxygen to the front part of my heart when I exercise. And it kept me alive. Unbeknownst to me, never had any chest pain, never had any problem. Did what I thought I needed to do. Lost, I lost 20 some pounds. But he was supplying blood to the front part of me. <laughs> Not that he was tired of keeping me, he said it's time for me to let him go. But I've been doing it. So the doctor said, he tried very, very hard to get through the block. But a, a stint of the block.
who he did it. He missed an opportunity to give God praise for what he had done in his life. God is doing things for all of us in this room today. Some things we know, some things we don't know. And he's still keeping us. But he's keeping us for a purpose. And he saves us for a purpose is to what? Give him glory. To praise him for what he's capable of doing in our lives. So when people say, hey, you were lucky, I said, no, I was not lucky. I had the hand of God watching me. I didn't even know it. I'm playing 18 holes of golf out there, walking and walking and walking, five and six miles. No chest pain. I didn't know that God was keeping me doing that. And he's keeping you. From who knows what. And it's not important as long as you know that it's God who's taking care of you. But we have an expectation to give him glory, to give him praise, to tell others about the goodness of God. And that's the purpose of praise. We're on this earth to praise him. Our lives should be in praise to his name. Our comings and our goings, coming to this church every Sabbath. There's more praising of God than announcement. We have an obligation to worship and to praise God for all the things that he's done to us, for us, and for those that we don't know. So I praise God today for him to watch and keep my heart beating and not leaving my family without a husband, without a father. I praise him for the doctors who found me. I praise him for the doctors who treated me because by his grace, here I am today. By his grace, you sit here today in the presence of God, in the presence of the Holy Spirit, and we need to be giving him praise. We need to take 30 seconds and give God praise.
is going to be for you to stay here for the rest of us. Let us all bow our heads together. Dear Father Kevin, we just want to come right now to tell you that we are grateful people. You are so faithful to us. Lord, we could never repay you for all that you have done for us. We could never repay you for the sacrifice that you have made on our behalf. We could never repay you, Lord, for what you and the angels do in our lives each and every day. The things that we do not see and the things that we do not know that are happening around us. But Lord, we have you. You said in your word that before we ask, you will ask. You said that if you feed the birds of the air faithfully each and every day, that you were going to take care of your children. And we thank you, Lord, for watching our back. We thank you, Lord, for watching Dr. Cooper's back. We thank you, Lord, for watching everyone's back here because it just shows just how faithful you are to us. We can't praise you enough. We can't thank you enough. We cannot lift your name enough for the things that you have done for us. And Lord, we just want to take the time right now just to say thank you. Because you been good to us. Thank you, Lord, because you have been kind to us. Thank you, Lord, because you have been faithful to us. You've done everything that you have said in your word that you would do and more because you love us and you've shown it through your actions. You've shown it by allowing your only child to come down here and to take the blame for something that I have done. We thank you, Lord, for the pain he endured. We thank you, Lord, for the shame that he took on. We thank you, Lord, for allowing him to carry my cross and to take my punishment. Lord, we thank you this morning. We thank you from the bottom of our hearts because you are a true and you are a mighty God. In words, we cannot put in words how grateful we are to you in allowing us to be your children and allowing us to call you our Father. Thank you, Lord, for the grace Thank you, Lord, for your everlasting mercies. Thank you, Lord, for your patience. And thank you, Lord, for your continual forgiveness of our sins. No one else could do this. No one else could make the sacrifice. No one else would have the patience or endurance to deal with us. But you do. And you forgive us time, time, time again. And you put us back on our feet when we fall. And you help us to stand tall, even though, Lord, we brought shame and embarrassment to us and to your name. We thank you for loving us in the manner that you do. In Jesus' name, let us all lift our voices and say, Amen.